Dear listener, welcome to a new life program on Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. I'm a presenter, Tieno Diamond. Today on the Bible story, our focus will be on the creation of Adam from the Bible in living sound. Afterwards, Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga will be joining us in the Bible segment to share with us on the topic, Why Money? But first, let us be blessed with the piece of item, courtesy of Adventist World Radio, and it's entitled, Take Time to Be Holy by Nathaniel Nyagol. Keep it locked. Is the blessed are bread when our hearts slowly bend and we gather to Jesus, our Savior and friend. If we come to Him in faith, His protection to share, what above for the way. to be there. Blessed are our prey. Blessed are our prey. What about for the weary? Oh, how sweet to be there. Welcome back. Let's praise the Lord's name through sharing in his words. It's time for the Bible story and I believe you do not wish to be left out on the creation story where our focus is on the creation of Adam. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, there he put the man whom he had formed. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. Adam? Adam is your name. And this is morning, the dawn of a new world. And you, uh, who are you? I am a messenger from God's throne in heaven. God? Heaven? God is the creator. By his might, all things have their existence and are sustained. He he created me? Yes, Adam. You are beautiful, Adam, and perfect. You are created in God's own image and after his own likeness. I'd like to see God. You will, Adam. You may see him and talk with him as long as you continue without sin. Sin? Sin is the transgression of God's royal law, disobedience to that law. You said God created me, didn't you? Yes. After his own likeness and image? Yes. Well, then why would I even think to disobey him? Make no mistake about it, Adam. You will be tempted. Sin will be made to appear desirable. God's adversary is wise clever. He will attempt to make you think that God's laws are unjust, unfair. God has an adversary, uh, an enemy. His name is Lucifer. At one time, he was the most beautiful of all created beings. He held the highest position of honor in God's universal kingdom. But pride, ambition, and a greed for even more honor got the better of him, and he rebelled against God. He is even now here, present, scheming to ally you on his side against God. I won't have anything to do with him. I won't even listen to him. Be warned, Adam, that Lucifer is clever, diabolically clever. You can never know what form he will take in his evil attempt to cause you to sin. You cannot be sure just how his temptations will be presented to you. Be careful, Adam, and put your trust always in God, and you will be safe from Lucifer. (laughs) 
But come, Adam, I must show you your garden home and acquaint you with your duties as ruler with absolute dominion over all the earth and every living thing upon the earth. This is the very center of your garden home, Adam. Oh, it's beautiful. God created it for you, Adam. From it, as the created son of God, you will rule the earth. Will God help me? All the power and might of God is at your disposal, Adam. You need only ask, and it shall be given you. How can I possibly fail with all power at my command? You cannot fail, Adam. Unless you yield to the temptations of the adversary, God will help me overcome the adversary. When you are tempted, just ask, and God's power will be with you, and a legion of angels will stand by your side. But why is God so good to me? All creation will always have that same privilege, to call on God in time of need. And now, Adam... Perhaps you wish to perform your first duty as ruler of Earth. As you say, God has created many animals and insects and creeping things. You will name them. That'll be a pleasure. They will parade before you, Adam. Name them according to your own pleasure. Oh, you're a pretty little thing. Furry and soft? Shall I call you furry because of your coat? Uh, no, no, cat. Yes, cat is your name. <laughs> oh, my, but you're large. Um, elephant. Elephant is your name. You're funny little fellows. <laughs> oh, what a face and a grin. I shall call you Monkey. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every creature that God had created. You said that sin is the transgression or disobedience of God's law. But you didn't say what God's law is. God's law is based upon one thing. Love. Well, isn't there a stipulated law? I mean, something that can be stated in exact words. There, in the very midst of the garden, are two trees. See them? Yes, I, I've noticed them. And the fruit of them is good to look at. One is the tree of life. The other, that one is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Ah. The law for you, simply stated, is this. Thou mayest eat the fruit of all trees except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Mm. Thou shalt not eat of it. But why? Because God loves you and wants you to be happy. Obedience brings happiness. I see now what you mean by love. God doesn't tell us created beings to do something or not to do something merely to be dogmatic but because he has our own welfare in mind. Oh, God does love his created beings, doesn't he? <sighs> I noticed that the animals, all of them, as they paraded before me, were in twos, in pairs. Male and female. <laughs> they seem... Well, contented and happy together. They complement and help each other. God made it thus. Oh, God is wise. Thank you so much for tuning in to Adventist World Radio. That was the Bible story. If you wish to contribute on the program, please write to us. Our postal address is Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276. Code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. AWR Nairobi at eku.adventist.org. We're now taking a short break, and when we come back, Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga will be talking to us on the topic, Why Money? This song is entitled, To the Blessed Hour of Prayer by Nathaniel Nyagol. Keep it tuned to the Voice of Hope. <music> Oh, 
Welcome back dear listener. It's now time for the Bible segment. Let us hear what Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga has in store for us. Dear listener, I want to welcome you to our biblical stewardship series. I want us to talk about money today and we want to answer a question why money why money there is a very interesting story i had about a very interesting couple who are dressed and speaking like common country folk a couple asked to see the president of harvard university because they looked common and unimportant they were made to wait for hours finally realizing they wouldn't leave the secretary went to get the president Confident that he could take care of the situation, the president walked out, briskly greeted the couple and asked how he could help them. They began to speak of their deceased son who had once attended Harvard University. We would like to erect a monument in our son's honor, they said. The president responded, if we allowed every family to erect a monument, this place would look like a cemetery. The parents quickly explained, we don't want a grave marker. We want to erect a building in his honor. Sensing that they obviously did not understand the financial implications of their intentions, the president said, do you realize how much this would cost you? The buildings on this campus are worth more than $7 million. The wife turned to the husband and said, do you mean that? Is all it takes to build a university? Why don't we just build one of our own? So Mr. and Mrs. Stanford walked out of Harvard University to establish in California Stanford University. See, when we talk about money, money is important because it impacts the way we see ourselves. If we don't have much money, we see ourselves not just as financially poor, but also as helpless and unimportant. Money is important because it affects how we see one another. We tend to treat people with money differently and give them favoritism. And that uh, is recorded in James chapter 2. Actually, money affects the way we look at God. Money is life. Why do I say that? Because money is a combination of time, talent, and energy turned into a medium of exchange. We put our money, our talent, and our energy together, and we are rewarded or paid for services provided or products produced with money. And when we have enough money, we begin to think we don't need God. It is rather significant that God's diagnosis of his church at the end of time, that is the church of Laodicea, is that they are lukewarm and materialistically satisfied. Now the paradox is that this end church, the Laodicean church, they see that God has blessed them so abundantly from their material possessions and uh, the money that they have and their balance sheets, and yet they forget that uh, Christ is the one who knocks at the door because the church has locked him outside. Could we be like that church? Now, when we talk about uh, money, there are many syndromes that we suffer from when it comes to the issues of money. Now, the problem, I want to say, is not a lack of money, but a lack of dependency on God. The moment we say we don't have enough money, we are really saying God is not big enough for us. Now, I want us to explore some of the syndromes in our lives that are connected with money. The first one is what we call the owner syndrome. You see, we tend to think of everything as ours. This is my house, my church, my suit, my car, etc. Now, with this kind of thinking, there is the worry about what is going to happen to what I own. When you don't have enough, you worry. And when you do have enough, you worry from fear of losing it. When we begin to fall into that ownership trap, we are actually taking God's place. But now there is another syndrome here. It's called the recognition syndrome. 
Well, many of us uh, know Bill Gates, and so Bill Gates is well known. But how happy is he with his 30 or 40 billion dollars? Would you like to have the tax authorities looking over your shoulder, examining everything that you do? Do you think, let me ask you, do you think is that peace and happy to be recognized as one of the wealthiest men on earth? There are times when not being recognized is an advantage. So, then why do we seek to be recognized by what we wear, what we do, or how much we have? There is another syndrome called the confidence syndrome. See, sometimes we begin to have confidence in what we own, forgetting that all belongs to God. How much money would it take to have full confidence that you could handle everything that came your way? There is still another syndrome. It's called the power syndrome that is brought uh, by money. And here we say there is danger when we begin to look for power in money instead of in God. Peter says in 2 Peter 1 verse 3 that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Paul says you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And Ephesians 2 verse 6 tells us that if we are in Christ, we are raised and seated with him in the heavenly places. So now, question comes. How much power then do you want? There is another syndrome that comes with money. It's called the control syndrome. Have you heard someone express thoughts like, until I see things changed, I am withholding my tithe and local church budget? How can financial blackmail change the church if the Holy Spirit is not going to do it? John Maxwell, well recognized as the Christian leadership guru, tells of a very interesting personal experience. In one of, of his early pastoring jobs, he says he had just a handful of people attending church regularly. A few months later, there were 60 to 65 people. Many changes had taken place and the congregation was growing. One day, you know, just as he was getting ready to go on the platform, one of the major donors in his congregation stopped him and said, You have been here six months and a lot of things have changed in this church. And unless certain things are changed back to the way they were, I am not going to give any more tithe. Now, John Maxwell responded, What are you telling me this for? Why don't you tell this one to the one you ought to? With that, he grabbed the church member by the arm, pulled him to his knees and said, Please repeat after me. Dear God, I have chosen to rob you. The man exploded. Don't say that. John Maxwell walked onto the platform to preach, knowing that this might be his last sermon in that church because of what he did to the man who gave more than 50% of the church budget. However, the man returned the following week and said, Thank you, Pastor. All this time I thought this was my church because I paid more than half of the budget. I thought it was mine to control. I have finally realized this is God's church, and never again will you have to struggle with me trying to control the church with my money. Now, there is still another syndrome called the if-only syndrome. See, our excuse is sometimes if we only had this or if we only had that, we would follow God's will for his church if we only had the money. And so we keep talking about if only, if only, if we only. But now there is another syndrome. It's called the Hezekiah syndrome. Hezekiah, wanting assurance, asked God to move the sundial back 10 degrees. Think of all the laws of physics that God had to balance to stop the earth on its rotation, move it back 10 degrees and restart it. By all the laws of physics and all the laws of the universe, that movement should have caused massive earthquakes and tidal waves to destroy this earth. Yet God with one little finger simply adjusted all merely to strengthen the weak faith of one man. However, and now this is the paradox, when people from Babylon arrived inquiring about this power that could reverse all the laws of nature, King Hezekiah responded by showing them all his riches. 
Consider how history might have changed had he shown them not his wealth, but a glimpse of God Almighty. But we know the result of his folly. A few days later, they returned. Those are the Babylonians. They returned to take all his wealth away. Now, as we conclude, I want us to look at the... The three principles of Matthew chapter 6 are very interesting about how to deal with our money. See, it all comes down to whom is in control of our lives and everything we have. Matthew 6 verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And here I want us to derive three principles. First principles found in Matthew 6 verse 19, we are told, do not store up earthly treasures. Therefore, make sure your priorities are correct. And let me ask you, where do you put your focus? Where is your focus? Advertisements today talk about needing a lot of money and a long life. We hear about the importance of retiring to enjoy the same, not a better lifestyle than we have now. God's idea, however, is that when we pass away, we would have administered God's resources so that there is nothing left to corrupt or to destroy, but it is left in his hands to manage as he wills. And therefore, the first principle is please do not store up earthly treasures. Now, the second principle, put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And this is what we read in Matthew 6 verse 25 to 31. Now, if I worry, I am saying I am God and I can take care of myself. There was one eminent uh, stewardship educator, Mel Rees, who tells a story of a wealthy man who owned a large farm. He always had the best crops in the neighborhood. He was known to say, this property belongs to God. I'm just managing it for God. I am faithful with my tithes and he blesses. One day the locusts came eating every grain in the field. They reached his property line and ate his wheat too. His neighbors and his friends came to him saying, Where was your God when the locusts came? His response is awesome. He said, If God wants to pasture his locusts on his wheat fields, that is his business. In other words, if God wants to feed his locusts on his wheat fields, that is his business. Oh, I wish we had that mindset when it comes to dealing with our property. The third principle is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, the problem is not with money, but the problem is with you and me. In Matthew 19, a rich young man asks Jesus what he must do to be saved. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. In expiration, the man claims to have kept all these commandments and asked what he still lacks. Jesus says to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. We often use this story to encourage people to give more in offering. But that is not the point of this story. The problem was not the wealth in itself, but the fact that the wealth stood between God and him. So the only way money will not own us is if we recognize that everything we have and everything we are belongs to him. And therefore, as we finish this broadcast, please say, Lord... Help me to realize everything that I am and everything that I have belongs to you. And therefore, I'm committing myself and everything that I have to you to be used for your glory. Amen. Well, that has been the Bible segment. Thank you for tuning in to Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. For more comments and suggestions, kindly write to Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Or send us an email through awrnairobi at eku.adventist.org. For those who work to ensure this program has reached you, we thank you and appreciate so much. I have been your host. Chileno Diambo, be blessed.
is the blessed Earl of Play. When the Savior draws near with our tender compassion, his children to hear. When he tells us we may cast at his feet every day, what a burn for the weary. to be there. Blessed are all pray, blessed are all pray, what a burn for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be Is the blessed Earl of Prey When the tempted and tried To the Savior who loves them Their soul was confined With a sympathizing heart He removes every care What a burn for the weary Blessed are all pray, blessed are all pray, what a burn for the weary, oh how sweet to be. The blessed are of prayer, trusting Him we believe that the blessings one needing will surely receive. In the fullness of His trust, we shall lose every care. What a blessing!